Welcome to the Evolution of Business show. I'm your host, Dave Clare. And on today's episode, we are going swimming with the sharks. No, not the great white sharks. No, not Greg Norman the shark, but none other than Dr. Glenn Richards of Australian Shark Tank. Dr. Glenn is gonna share with us a story about how ambition, a long train ride through Europe, a bottle of vodka, and a love for animals led to him building a pet care empire all across Australia and throughout China. He's also gonna let us have some insights into his own personal evolution and how he shifted his thinking from being a veterinarian into a business person or CEO of a major organization. He's also gonna let us understand the importance of transformative thinking uh, from in terms of a business evolution. And finally, he's gonna share with us some insights and what he sees into the future and how outsourcing and building a network of support services is going to be critical to survival going forward into the future. So without further ado, let's go swimming with the sharks. Welcome to the Evolution of Business podcast. Business is a series of evolutions. This podcast explores how to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people you choose to serve. It will look for the lessons and the failures of the past and share the success of those getting it right today. What is the next evolution of your business? Now, here's your host, Dave Clare. Uh, but I'm very excited today to have an amazing guest on, uh, Dr. Glenn Richards. Now, Glenn and I met, I think it was probably December 2018, it might have been, two years ago. Yeah. Uh, I was the opening keynote at a, a conference in Queensland, and uh, Dr. Glenn was doing the closing keynote. Uh, and it was awesome to sit around and, and uh, sit through his presentation, and it really got me to understand uh, a lot about his story, because I really didn't know much about uh, you at that stage, other than obviously what I'd seen on TV through Shark Tank. But uh, I really was so impressed with uh, Dr. Glenn, and it's just a humble Australian business guy. Um, some of Glenn's greatest accomplishments, though, is the fact that, A, he's a devoted family man. He's married and has three daughters and, and still lives in Queensland, where he is today. I think all the family are outside right now uh, so that he can be sharing some time with us. So he's given up his time uh, with his family to be here. Um, but he still has a strong love for animals and continues to have three dogs and three horses to keep the family company. Though I don't think the three horses are on the Sunshine Coast right now. Uh, but apart from that... Uh, he's the founding managing director of Green Cross, sorry, Green Cross, um, was the co-founder and director of Mammoth Pet Holdings, uh, which was a pet farm before it merged with Green Cross. Um, Glenn will tell you a lot more, but he grew up on a grazing property in Richmond, uh, northwestern Queensland, where his love for passion and animals began. Uh, his parents owned a number of properties and farmed sheep and cattle up there. But at 27, he bought a small vet practice in Townsville, and within 10 short years, he developed five vet clinics and a large format pet store in Townsville, uh, as well as two veterinary hospitals in China. From there, he went to build a multi-million dollar integrated pet care empire. I love that, a pet care empire, which now <laughs> more than uh, veterinary hospitals in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Green Cross is also um, Australasia's leading specialty pet care retailer with more than 300 stores operating under the brand names Pet Barn and City Farmers in Australia and uh, animates uh, in New Zealand. And the company employs over 6,000 employees, including vets, nurses, retail team members, and managers. And I'm just sharing with uh, Dr. Glenn that my daughter works for uh, City Farmers up in Geraldton. Uh, so I was teasing her about the fact that I'm interviewing her boss today, but uh, there might be some news in that. Uh, so since moving from his uh, executive role, Glenn now spends his time as a professional investor, mentor, and director with a number of companies. And his favorite area of interest is helping to scale up health and allied health companies. Um, he's a chairman of so many different companies, of uh, ASX listed companies, Healthier and People Infrastructure. He's also the chairman of two private companies, uh, Cardionexus, I'm gonna say, and Naturo Technologies. He's also the non-executive director of SmartVet, PetSure, uh, and Adventure Holdings Australia. Uh, more recently known for his role as an investor and his time on Shark Tank Australia. But Glenn continues to foster early stage businesses, including his Shark Tank investments through active mentoring, investing and strategic planning sessions. He regularly does public uh, appearances and speaking engagements in his business community. And he does share his scaling up story with his V4P message of vision, planning, people, patience and passion. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I welcome to the Evolution of Business podcast Dr. Glenn Richards. Uh, I'm sure there's a big virtual round of applause going on right now. Uh, 
but Dr. Lin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, and I'm sure that, that that wasn't everything. I mean, but that's one of them. <laughs> oh, I'm exhausted listening to you, Dave. Can I go now? Yeah. Uh, every time you sit there and you read that the stuff out, and you go, you know, because I know you're home guy. And you think like, wow, like, you know, that's, that's a lot of stuff. I always say when people read out my bio, my mom wrote it. Because <laughs> that nice thing is, is my mother. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because you, you know, we're, we're talking about the evolution of business, but, you know, it just happens. You know, you, 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 you keep your eyes open for opportunities and, and I guess you, uh, uh, you're willing to, to put the time, energy, effort and, and passion out there. You know, good things happen. That's the reality. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, part of the, the, the podcast, I'm going to ask a series of questions a little bit later, but could you just take us on a little bit of the Dr. Glenn Richards journey from that um, grazing property in uh, northwest Richmond, northwest Queensland, to how you came to have a pet care empire? I mean, it's a fascinating story because, you know, you, you barely look like you're like, like you was 27 when you bought that pet care thing there. So you can't be much more than 20 years total. <laughs> What, what, how did you do that in 20 years? Yeah, David, certainly go all the way back, but you know, growing up in Western Queensland, so we're talking outback, outback Australia, and, and, and I guess most Australians uh, don't bench too far in, inland, but uh, so we were about a uh, six, oh, gee, seven hour drive from, from Townsville, Western Queensland, and uh, I was finishing up uh, grade 10, moving into grade 11, and my, my dad said, what are, you, uh, what are you planning to study when you finish high school? And I said, oh, thinking about accounting and uh, dad, we're, we're doing a lap of uh, the properties. You've got to run your waters and run your fence lines and make sure, you know, your, your sheep and cattle are okay. They could, and he pulled the vehicle up and said, look, uh, accounting, why, why don't you do something useful uh, like veterinary science? And, uh, and that, he put that idea in my head and I finished, finished school, took a year off um, before going to university, but I enrolled in veterinary science and uh, got in and uh, went to University of Queensland. When I finished there, um, I had the choice between uh, mixed practice and, and a very smart uh, companion animal practice in Brisbane and decided that if I was going to do my first year in practice uh, as a vet, I, I should probably go with one of the, uh, the premium practices or better practices and uh, ended up in a, in a practice called Kessels Road in Brisbane for a year and uh, then decided I wanted to head back more towards my roots uh, in, in production animal and, and sheep and cattle and uh, enrolled in a research master's in, in uh, researching the link between nutrition and reproduction in boss eating as cattle or Brahmin cattle. And uh, after two and a half years of research masters, uh, when I finished that degree, uh, realized that, that um, the rural industries were quite depressed in Australia, wasn't a lot of investment certainly no investment for a young vet wanting to influence production animals in Australia. So uh, uh, packed my backpack and, and went to London for, um, uh, for a couple of years and uh, rolled straight into companion animal practice over there and linked up with, uh, with a guy who, who had a number of sites in London. Uh, and it gave me the opportunity, I guess, to really start understanding the business of veterinary science. And uh, while working in the companion animal practices, I studied this, uh, this model of uh, vet clinics and pet stores and, and the way they could collaborate together with a model called Pets at Home and, uh, and, and the vet clinics they had associated with those pet stores. I um, also spent a lot of time, as, as vets and going through vet school, we learn a lot about being clinicians and learn very little about business and um, spent two years really reading all the books that people read if they're doing a Masters of Business and... Um, by the end of my time in, in London, I decided it was time to come home. Um, I had a pretty good idea that I wanted to get into companion animal rather than mixed practice or production animals. Um, I thought the future for me was the fact that people were starting to take their, their dog or their cat from the yard and put it into their house. And if it's not in the house, that absolutely would be in the bedroom. So this um, anthropomorphic change or the way that people a bonding with their pets has really grown. And, and, and so for Australia, um, it was just starting to evolve. When I was in London, you know, you'd go to the pub and people find out you're a vet and they instantly put you up there beside a, a neuroscientist or, a, or a, you know, a, 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 someone who uh, is an astronaut. Whereas in Australia, I think we were still somewhere down next to a, uh, um, an undertaker 
um, as important to society. So, you know, it was an interesting time for me to understand the importance of pets and the importance of pets in the human animal bond and the way they enrich society. So um, I decided to get on a, uh, on a train to travel from, from uh, London back to, um, from Moscow back to Australia. And just before I got on the train, I, I rang up a vet practice in Townsville and I said, look, I'm really keen to, to go back to North Queensland. I'm from North Queensland. Um, are you interested in selling me your vet practice? And uh, Carol and Michael, who are the, the, the vendors of the practice, um, said, look, we are thinking about selling the vet practice. And I said, well, who knows? And they said, well, no one knows. And I said, well, look, don't tell anyone. Tell me about the practice. What's it turn over? How many pets do you see? How many clients do you have? And space of about seven minutes, um, they told me about their practice and uh, told me how much they wanted when they, they would, how much they wanted to sell it for. And I said, look, that sounds pretty reasonable. I had a bit of a fundamental understanding of business and valuation metrics. And I said, look, that sounds reasonable. Um, tell no one that it's on the market. Um, I will, as soon as I get back to Australia, we'll organise the legals and organise the funding and uh, we'll get this, get this done. So in the space of seven minutes, I've hung up and gone, holy shit, I've uh, pretty much pledged that I'd buy a vet practice in Townsville. Uh, young vet, you know, backpacking around Europe, yeah. Where do you find any money? And, uh, you know, as we all know in the startup community, it's friends, families and fools that, that you, you approach to help back any venture you're, you're trying to go. You were really set up, did you? Yeah, hadn't, had, had no idea. So, <laughs> so I, no idea. So I rang, rang my father who was in Western Queensland on one of those old wind-up uh, yeah. party lines and uh, rang dad and said, look, um, just negotiated to buy a vet practice in Townsville. How, how do you feel about... Um, guaranteeing some bank loans and maybe even lending me some money and he instantly hung the phone up and I thought oh well it was a bad connection and uh, rang him back and I said what happened he said I oh, just wanted to think about that for a minute or two and uh, he said tell me what you're about and what you're up to so I explained you know it was a good practice it was in Townsville I, was, I knew about it um, but I said I need your support and he said look I need you if I'm going to support you I want you to write a business plan um, and when you get back to Australia come and tell me about the practice and put the plan in front of me so I know I'm not going to lose uh, my money. And I said, okay, that's fair. Um, so I got on the train in Moscow, um, see a white outside. There's uh, Ukrainian traders going from Moscow to, to Beijing and uh, I spent seven days writing a business plan that was originally about, the plan was about buying one vet practice in, in Townsville. As the, as the trip went on, you know, you your view of the world got bigger thanks to a combination of nothing else to think about and lots of vodka. And so yeah. by the time, by the time I got to, uh, to Beijing, I'd written a business plan to create a network of veterinary hospitals across Australia called Green Cross and um, pitched my dad the business plan. And he said, look, love your big vision, but let's just concentrate on one practice at a time and let's help you buy your practice in Townsville. And then let's see where you end up. And, uh, so that practice was, was pretty much the, the basis to, and that business plan was the basis to, uh, I guess, where we ended up with Green Cross, that we end up with a network of hospitals. The original plan was more franchise-like. Uh, what, we, what we evolved, um, we uh, joined up with a group of vets in Brisbane and created a co-op. And that co-op then morphed into a corporate entity. <clears throat> and we went from sort of a cooperative of about 17 practice to, to listing a group of veterinary practices on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2007 uh, with 32 clinics. And that was the basis and foundation platform uh, to what became, and, and he's still the largest uh, consumer facing pet care business in Australasia. Um, so while the vet practices were evolving and we started growing, um, I also set up a pet store in Townsville with a with, uh, with a couple of people and um, said to, to, to a couple of mates from Sydney, I said, you, you should come up and have a look at this pet store. It's, it's quite remarkable how well it does. And it was a thousand square metre, large format pet store. And they came up and had a look at it. The next thing uh, they came back to me and said, look, we love, we love this whole space that you're talking about. And we found a group of pet stores in Sydney called Pet Bar, the group of five. Um, we're forming a foundation group of investors. We want you part of it. And uh, so we, we formed a foundation group of shareholders and, uh, and a board. 
and uh, bought Pet Barn or the five five stores and, and uh, then got serious about professionalizing, um, I guess, the pet store retail space as well. So Pet Barn and everything we did there grew and grew more uh, around uh, opening up new stores. Um, Green Cross, we've listed and we grew more by acquisition. And over a period of about uh, five to six years, our networks started to cross over and the head of uh, Pet Barn, uh, Paul Wilson and I used to ski together and we'd talk often about the the concept of, of joining forces and focusing on providing for the needs of our pet owners from everything from retail to, to veterinary services to grooming and, and put all that together under one structure. And uh, so over time, that, that, uh, uh, that logic was then... Uh, introduced into our boardrooms in both Pet Barn and Green Cross and uh, uh, some of our board members decided it was a really good idea and we, we then went through the logic, both the financial and industrial logic of bringing it all together. And so in 2000 and February 2014, uh, we finally merged. Basically, we were a public listed company as Green Cross Limited at Bentley Clinics and we backdoored our pet stores into Green Cross and, and uh, uh, Originally, Green Cross was about a 350 million market cap. We brought Pet Barn in and merged together. And uh, within six months, we were about a $1.2 billion uh, enterprise. Um, and, uh, and I thought around about that time, it was a serious time for me to think about moving on. Uh, mm. And so I sat on the board of Green Cross Limited, with pet stores and vet clinics, uh, pretty much for the last four years. Five years, and uh, and then we decided to sell the whole enterprise to a private equity uh, firm out of San Francisco, TPG. So it was right. delisted last year, and it now is under private equity ownership, and continues to do exceptionally well. Great pet stores, great veterinary clinics, and uh, uh, and some great culture that, that continues to exist today. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So what you're saying is you're not my daughter's boss anymore. Correct. Okay. <laughs> oh, I know she's probably very sad about that, but. Uh, uh, on, the, on the flip side, uh, leaving the executive team in 2014, and, and, and I did sell some shares, which, which gave me a, uh, a fund to, con to continue my investment uh, in, in health and food tech and, and a few other enterprises. And uh, I guess where I, I invest these days is in healthcare, uh, both in uh, research and development and, and uh, developing, you know, innovative healthcare products, as well as uh, health consolidation. So I've been involved in GP medical centres, I've been involved in private day hospitals, I'm still involved in physio, podiatry, hand therapy in, under Healthier. Uh, with people infrastructure, we, we're the largest supplier of uh, nurses on the, agency nurses on the east coast of Australia, as well as our, our uh, mobile workforce business. Um, our cardiac scientists, uh, the largest Cardiac Science Group in in, uh, in Australia, and, and uh, we provide uh, echo services right across uh, Queensland and slowly emerging into other states. Um, yeah. Involved in Naturo Technologies, developing um, and adding value in, in milk and avocado supply chain. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I do, as well as sitting on the board of Adventure Holdings, which is uh, a very large supplier of Austral and uh, companion uh, camping and leisure equipment and, and industrial products. So quite a diverse portfolio of activities across a range of industries now. Oh, absolutely. So you've gone from uh, pet care to people care. Correct. Yeah, very cool. Because so, uh, I'd also like to talk about how you got roped into Shark Tank, because I believe you got roped into that, but uh, by one of your good friends. Uh, yeah. Um, but just a couple of things came up when you were sharing your story there. Um, your dad said, give me a business plan, so I, I want to make sure that I'm not going to lose money. So, I mean, in a lot of the work that you do, obviously, with startups and stuff, you probably say the same thing, echoing, your, do you ever hear your father's voice in your head as you say, don't be right. rich, you know, I'm not going to lose money. Um, There's a great lesson you learned there about the same things. But <clears throat> when you talk about having this bigger view of the world when you're on that train, and I remember you telling that story over in Queensland, I'm just giggling away as you're getting drunk on whatever Polish vodka or whatever it might have been as you're <laughs> catching the train across. Um, but do you think if you went back to your dad, when with just the plan to buy that one clinic, that he may have backed you? I, I think so. You know, parents parents are probably to some degree of blind faith in their children, but at the same time, 
as I say to, to a lot of startups that are backed by their families, you need to take their money very seriously. Yes. And the fact that you're exposing their retirement plans to the vagaries of business, you need to put the work in and have a healthy respect for their money, be it the fact that they're your parents. But mm. that, that probably, I think, puts more more pain into the into the conversation. So I did take it very seriously and I push it hard on my startups and scale ups that I back now that don't think taking money from your family is cheap money. It is so serious and you need to put the time and effort into your business plan, um, developing financial roadmaps, um, trying to, to guess what the future may hold. So you, you you're doing scenario planning around if it may go this way, it may go that way, or it may go really bad. So you've got to have all those, put that work in because a lot of entrepreneurs have these things I call the entrepreneurial seizure. And I know there are a number of podcasts, but it does concern me where people wake up and go, I'm going to have a great new product. I've got a great idea. I convinced my friends, family and fools to back me without putting the effort into trying to get a, a decent business plan in place and a, a decent financial roadmap to, to road test it with, consumers or customers or potential customers and you know, some of that fundamental stuff that's so important um, and you know I knew the veterinary industry exceptionally well I had worked as a vet in Townsville I've been a research scientist in Townsville um, I got hold of all the databases from the Townsville City Council to know exactly where all the registered dogs were um, I built out a three-year financial plan on going from one vet clinic to two vet veterinary clinics um, I then started having entrepreneurial seizures at and opening more clinics in Townsville. But the reality is um, I got better at the financial planning the older I got and understood the importance of getting help uh, in building financial plans. So having um, accountants and financial controllers involved in, in my life, uh, the older I got became far more important. So those accountants actually uh, did become important. <laughs> correct, correct. And, and you know, I, I was, it's one of the first hires I say to, and I look, at, I look at teams I invest in these days, you've got to have the ideas person, and it's usually the entrepreneur too, because they're, they're, they're wired and fired, and you know, bracing along and grabbing ideas. Then you've got to have the detail person, the person that actually will actually end up doing the execution. And you've got to have that person who's good at the finance, can build the the forecasts, but also make sure that all those little bits inside the business, the bills are paid on time, you're, you're monitoring cash flow, uh, and you're trying to predict the, the future. You, you know, you've got to have a team, and then you've got to have the operations person, the one that it can deliver. So I like a team of three, and it and, uh, took me a while as a young vet to realise the importance, because as a young vet, you know, you get taught in vet school, you're going to help everybody, and you need to know everything. And to change your mindset, become a business owner, and an entrepreneur is quite different to being a vet. And as a vet, we're going to help everyone and we're going to save every, every pet in the world. Um, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's damn hard. And I, you know, there's some, some times in your life you've just got to look back and go, I wish I'd realised some of the, uh, the weaknesses in what I did and how I went about it much earlier. And I would have probably got to where I got to a lot quicker. Uh, but, you know, I used to do everything. I did the finance. I did the bookkeeping. I did the marketing. Um, I changed the light bulbs. In, in my veterinary practices in Townsville. And the reality is I should have been handing over some of that stuff earlier. And it wasn't until I'd been going for about seven years that I had a full-time financial controller. Um, I had a, an ops manager and I was sort of the, the, the senior clinician and entrepreneur or business owner there. Yeah, and there's really, really powerful lessons in there. The, um, and I like that. The, so which were you, the detail or the financial? Which, which am I better at? Which, which one is the idea guy? I'm the idea guy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I get excited by, by business. I love business. It's almost a hobby. Um, but I also, you know, I have these ideas that, that, and, and then I want to run out and start, start doing them. And what I've learned over time and, and, and through the work of studying uh, Liz Wiseman, the, the multipliers, um, I realised that you know I'm an accidental, and she uses the term accidental diminisher because the idea guys always got stuff thrown into the team, and yeah. all you do is hijack them and go, which idea are we supposed to be doing? Yeah. So what I got good at in, in Green Cross, so as as we're evolving a big organisation, was to put my ideas on a list, and I wasn't allowed to open that list up until we got to our 90 day resets. So every 90 days in Green Cross, we pull up and have a full day on the business, a full strategic reset. 
and I was allowed to table my ideas right at the start of the day alongside feedback from our employees and feedback from our customers and critical issues that were happening, as well as Glenn's crazy list of shit that would come up on stuff we should think about. Um, and, and so, you know, entrepreneurs generally are a little bit chaotic because they're running to the next big thing. And when I mentor um, entrepreneurs and I mentor business people these days, it's going, you've got to focus. At some point, you've got to stop chasing shiny stuff. Slow down and focus on the one thing that's going to get you to the next level. Yeah, and I think it's really important that, um, like the, the work I do with clients in terms of what I call my next 90 business uh, evolution process is the same thing. So it's 90 day uh, planning cycles. So they have quarterly intensive, monthly coaching, weekly accountability. Uh, and I have what I call a fast execution process, right? Which is exactly what you're talking about. Because uh, after studying, and, and you, I love your thoughts on this, uh, business owners, leaders, entrepreneurs who execute extremely well versus ones that don't, I found four common things of uh, those who did extremely well. And, and I created a nice little acronym fast for it, which is focus. So they have an innate focus on what matters most in that quarter. They have a system yeah. of accountability in place. They know who's responsible for what. Right? And they keep it very simple. The plan is very simple and it's transparent. So they focus on accountability, simplicity, and transparency. So everybody can see what everybody's working on and everybody knows nobody can hide. Love it. And, and that's that group accountability. When you've got a high performing team, you have all got each other's backs. No one's trying to score points. There's no ego. It's just, we know what we're trying to achieve. We know what we're trying to achieve this week, this 90 days, and then you reset that to get your, you know, your annual goals. I'm still, what are you going to achieve this year? And where are we on our road to those, those three year financial targets? Yeah. And then you're back to the, that last piece of what is the big area of audacious goal? What's the big vision we're trying to achieve here? Yeah. And, and I love what you're doing and how you coach that because you know, small business do need mentors and they need peer mentors, but they need that disciplined framework to work around, which then frees you up to have those crazy ideas and have them road tested inside your business. Um, you know, that fail fast thing. But, but the reality is you know, you've got to have a framework. You've got to have a meeting cycle and have the discipline to have them in your calendar and your schedule. So you know that, and, and we, we did it quite well, and exactly the similar framework in, in, in what you're doing there, Dave, is, is the daily huddle. What are you up to today? What's stopping you to get it done? The weekly accountability meeting. Where are you at in the projects that you should be working on? What are the KPIs? What did you achieve last week? What are you working on this week? And then you move to that monthly and we used to call it our 2M, our monthly management meeting, which we pulled all our middle management in, all our senior management in. So that was part education, part accountability, part execution, so everyone knew what was being pushed down through the organisation. And then it's those 90-day resets that, that are so important that goes, did we achieve it? And what have we got to achieve in the next 90 days, which is on our journey to get our 12-month goals achieved? Yeah, 100%. And, uh, and you actually talked about this, Phil, but my uh, model business canvas, and this is what I use with people here, is, is the purpose, values, vision, what's the big vision? So you talk about you said, like the vision of having all this across there. And then you work with, well, who do I need to become in the next three years to start creating that world? Um, and then, well, the business we need to build to start creating that world in the, in the 10 or 20 years from now. Um, then what are the three-year objectives? Then what do we need to do in the next 12 months to be on track for three years? And then quarter by quarter, it works up 90 day uh, progress from the bottom up to the top. So we're just tracking every quarter. And then with weekly accountability online platform, here's my objective, my key results, where are we tracking? Um, oh, I, lo I love it because you, you, as business owners, it's, it's like going to the Olympics. You do need people to mentors or coaches and or coaches uh, that, that just hold you accountable. And then I love your comment about that group accountability inside your team. You, you all know each other, what you're working on, whether you're achieving it. And it was interesting to watch some of my team sack themselves off because they weren't keeping up. They knew yeah. the business had moved on and they weren't, they weren't achieving what they're supposed to. And even though we're helping them and, and you know, tapping out and tapping in some new tower to, yeah. to continue that journey. Um, but, you know, the big, hairy, audacious goal, it's an interesting one because I often see small business stay small because they don't have people to help them with their their view on where they're trying to get to so yeah. having 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 a coach or a mentor or even peer mentors ask you that big hairy question yeah. what are you trying to achieve you know I, 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 this is what i want to achieve in the next five to ten years and you go well that doesn't see that big and i, and I still remember jeff david part of our um, our pet phone days 
he said, to, how, how many pet stores do you think we could become in the Australian landscape? And the five of us sitting around the original foundation team for Pet Farm, we said, oh, 20 or 30. He said, well, hang on, how, how many pet stores are there in Australia? And he said, oh, it's two and a half thousand. And his simple question was, well, why wouldn't we be you know, 25, 30% of the Australian pet store scene? Why wouldn't we have 500 pet stores? Yeah. And, and you lift your line of sight and you went, that's a, that's a fair question. And then you simply have to, how do you fund it? What operational team do you need? What operational expertise? Um, what location? You know, all those things then are part of building that plan. But to have that simple question, why wouldn't we be 500? And I yeah. went back into the, into the veterinary camp and said the same thing to our guys. You know, guys, we're, we're thinking, you know, we're a 30, 30 group or 17 group co-op. Why wouldn't we merge all together? And, and why wouldn't we get to 500 veterinary clinics across Australia? Why wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, this is, so the one thing to um, challenge people on and what you're talking about there is, is I call it like epic thinking, right? Because epic thinking, uh, when you start asking epic questions, it drives epic thinking, which gets epic results. So that was a really mm-hmm. question that was asked. Well, why couldn't we? And then it started to lead to having epic thinking about that. Well, what would we need to do and how would we do that? And then all of a sudden now you have epic results and you have a uh, pet care empire, you know? But if you didn't ask that question, I, I, love the ter- I love the term epic question because it's asking the big question, of, yeah. of, which is, you know, it's easy for me these days because the, you don't have to ask too many questions, but you have to ask the right one of the right entrepreneur. Yeah. And, and, you know, I look back and some of the conversations I've had and they've retold me what I've said to them. And I went, I can't remember even saying that, but it, it absolutely changed the direction they were going by a simple question. I yeah. wasn't trying to play with their head. I was you know, naively asking those sort of questions. Uh, to see yeah, where, where, how they would lift or respond. What, what were you talking about there? I think the secret sauce isn't when you find the right answer, it's when you find the right question to ask. Correct. And, and that's when you start that discovery process. And if you make that question an epic question, um, and they're like, you know, like, how would you put yourself out of business? And this is sometimes what I ask a lot of uh, small business owners, you know, mm-hmm. what would you do to put yourself out of business? How would you put yourself out of business? And they're like, well, why do I want to do that? I said, because I assure you, somebody else is thinking about it. So when you choose to put yourself out of business, you're just putting your old way of doing business out of business. But when somebody else puts you out of business, you're out of business. I think that's a spot on. I, I, I love that. And it's, it's, if you think about the competitor, either real or imagined, yep. and going, how are they going to disrupt me? And, yeah. and you know, I guess you could simply say, why didn't the taxi industry of Australia, you know, 10 years ago when Uber was starting to get moving in, in, uh, in California, yep. what are we going to do about Uber? 10 years ago, rather than wait for them to come and then have the big political fight and hope the government was going to play on the side of, of the, uh, you know, the, the group that was still here, the taxi. So it's asking, asking those, I think you're spot on, epic, the epic question yeah. of the right, the right team. Yeah, and that, and that I think is really powerful. So speaking of epic questions, uh, one of your friends asked me an epic question. Sorry, Dave, I just missed that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so one of your buddies asked you an epic question at one stage to see if you wanted to participate in something. You want to tell us how you ended up on Shark Tank? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the great Steve Baxter. Uh, so Steve, Steve uh, and I met um, at a conference in, uh, in Europe and, and became quite good friends. Um, and, and he'd done a season of Shark Tank. Um, they were about two weeks, maybe three weeks out from starting the next filming uh, of Shark Tank 2 in Australia and uh, John McGrath decided he was going to list his uh, real estate company, McGrath uh, Real Estate, and had pulled out two to three weeks before filming started. So all the different sharks, Janine and Naomi and Andrew and Steve were approaching business owners or entrepreneurs that are, mm-hmm. were, had done quite well and were probably in a position that they could come on the show without disrupting too much their current enterprise. and. We we're out to dinner and Steve, right at the start of the dinner, Steve said to me, oh, Glenn, um, John McGrath's resigned from uh, Shark Tank. How do you feel about me putting your name up to the producers to, uh, for a slot on the show? And I said, no way in the world. No, no way in the world. I, I said, so the only thing going is the fact I'm having a sabbatical right now. It was uh, 2014 or coming into 2015. I said, I'm having a sabbatical. But I said, absolutely no way. I want to stay under the radar. By the time he got to the end of the meal, his wife, my wife, 
Steve had been adding a couple of bottles of red wine and they all hit me up again. And, and uh, Steve said, look, I want to put your name forward. You can always say no. And I said, oh, look, put my name up then. About a week later, I was in Sydney. I did a screen test. Um, there are a whole bunch of other uh, business people sort of up doing screen tests. And uh, I guess they're after a personality that, that fitted in with the other, the other guys on the panel, um, as well as had some track record of reasonable success in in the business community in Australia, and uh, uh, a few days later, it was a sun. Uh, it was a Friday night, and the producer rang me and said, "Look, we'd like you to be the, the new shark on Shark Tank. How do you feel about that?" And I said, uh, "Look, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think I want to do it." They said, "Look, we'll give you two days to think about it. Otherwise, we've got to go on to the next person because we're starting filming in one week." So Sunday, we're sitting around the dinner table, and I said to my family, "Look." Uh, I've had this screen test and they want me to do this gig called Shark Tank and they all went, what's Shark Tank? So I had to explain it to my, my wife and my, uh, well, my wife knew about it, but my, my, my children. And I said, I don't think I really want to do it because I just, and they go, why wouldn't you want to do it? And I said, you know, the, the concept of going on national TV, looking like a dickhead on national TV, um, you know, they're going, Dad, you, you just, you're just not willing to put yourself out there. It's exactly what you tell us when we go to school and they're all still school age, when we go to school and you say, well, step up and run in the cross country or step up and, uh, you know, play in the band or step up and, and uh, swim in the team. Uh, and you know, it's going to hurt, but you make us, you know, at least put ourselves out there. Why wouldn't you do the same? So back at your dad. So they, they, oh, all, threw it. they all threw it back at me and said, you're only not wanting to do it because you're worried it might be a little bit painful. I said, spot on. And they said, well, that's no excuse. You, you need to go down and do, do Shark Tank. And the rest is history. Ended up on Shark Tank. Um, you know, the, it was a lot of fun. Great. The, great, the panel, was, you know, they're great people. Wonderful people. And we're still, still quite good friends. Your big decision came on the back end of alcohol. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There is a theme forming. Uh, I, 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 you've got to be very careful about that. I think you still get the cold light of day in the morning. But... Um, there is some lubrication that go, does help in, in some of your thinking, no doubt. Loosens up the thinking, it's great. Um, okay, so let, let's, I want to get into a couple of quick questions. Uh, considering all that journey, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it's, I mean, we could probably talk for three or four hours, but I'd like to get into, out of all that time, what, what do you see as your most significant or biggest personal evolution that you had during that time? What would you reflect on? Just because, because to me, once again, part of evolution of business the more we evolve ourselves, the more we can evolve our team, the more that our business evolves, and then our clients receive that because they're the ones who deserve. You know. But if the leader doesn't evolve, so it's really important that we start evolving ourselves first. Yeah, look, I think I was a vet, I was a business owner, and that was sort of a growing, uh, fine-tuning exercise. But it wasn't until we listed 32 veterinary clinics, uh, we had two to 300 staff overnight, just slammed it all together. And uh, I brought on a, um, a CFO that had public company experience. Craig, Craig had um, worked in a public company and, and knew, the, knew the landscape. And so we brought him on to help. And Craig, probably fairly and quite rightly, in the space of a few months, formed the opinion that, that I was a good vet, uh, but maybe not a good CEO, and spent a first year of us being a public company as Green Cross Limited. Um, approaching my board members and my chairman that perhaps they had the wrong guy in the CEO seat and perhaps uh, they should work out where else to put me or kick me out of the company. Um, and, 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 you know, quite rightly, I was a vet. I had a team of 60 people. Um, I'd never run a public company. I hadn't run a big management team. And uh, um, once I realised Craig was, was picketing the... Uh, the board, uh, Craig and I had a fairly fairly abrupt conversation that, that there wasn't room for both of us in the company and, and he ended up leaving and I stayed. I was one of the senior shareholders and, uh, uh, but it did help me reflect on that I needed really to grow, um, to evolve, um, almost to, to step up to the plate of being a CEO. And so I spent a lot more time on my self-development. And one of those was uh, um, going along with my chairman to, uh, a Vern Harnish Growth Faculty Workshop. Oh, yeah. And it was through that, that workshop, that by the end of the day, I, I realised that as a CEO, 
Um, I had to go from being a, trying to control everything, trying to know everything, trying to have all the answers for my team, to being a challenger, to being a delegator, to asking the questions. So I worked out instant epiphany, and this is your evolution point. Um, transformational thinking was, I just have to find great people to come into my team on all those different disciplines that we've got to work in concert, you know, great, great marketing, great finance, great operational execution, um, um, acquisitions team that can go out and acquire more veterinary hospitals and join our network. And, and so what I worked out is my job was not to know everything. My job was to hold my team accountable, give them the responsibility, but help them with the vision on where we're going and, and help mm. um, support them and create an environment that allowed really good thinking, really good debates without anyone trying to score political points and, and ego was put outside the room. And one of our other key founders was, was John Odlum. So John and I shared a strong vision that we needed to improve how we operated vet clinics uh, in, our, in our landscape, uh, be able to have multi-site and support our teams from a corporate back end point of view, but allow our clinicians and our practice managers to, to grow their teams. Um, and so it was, it was pretty important to me. And so it was a, a epiphany. And I went back to the team and said, got this wrong. You don't need me to know everything. You just need me to help create this environment that is going to get the best out of you and hold you accountable to where we're trying to get to in the next three years, the next five years, and to achieve that vision of being the largest and best and highest quality veterinary group in Australasia. Yeah, and that's, that's so powerful because like, uh, from a leadership in, in coaching space, I say, um, there's things you need to know and there's things you need to understand. And the only thing you need to know as a leader is who knows. Well, the first thing you must know, who knows, right? Uh, yeah. And then it, you need to understand how it all works together. You need to know who knows, so which is having that team around you because the moment you think you have to know everything, um, you actually become useless. Exactly, and, and it, 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 I've worked with some narcissistic leaders in my time that have to be the smartest people in the room. And, and, and again, you know, I'll quote Liz Wiseman's work in Multiplier. You know, do you want to be the genius or do you want to be the genius maker? And, and as CEOs in modern workplaces, our job is to create and help create genius and genius teams that, that can create, you know, exceptional uh, outcomes for, for, for the customer and exceptional outcomes for our employees. And I've worked with some narcissistic leaders and I've even invested in one or two and got it wrong in my due diligence and realised that when you have got people that think they are the smartest people in the room, you ought to run like hell because there's no room for other people's opinions. There's no room for robust debate. There's no room for that collective wisdom, that group collective wisdom that, yeah. that creates great greatness. And there is no way that one person is smarter than, than, a, than a group of people. And, uh, and when you realize you're working with narcissists, you run like hell or you get rid of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the whole essence of leadership is about, you know, helping uh, other people become the best version of themselves so they can do their life's best work while they're in your care and beyond, which means caring about them as human beings first and point second. But if you apply that to genius, it's the same thing. It's, it's empowering and lifting and inspiring and, and raising genius, not being the genius. And, and so, you know, part of the part of the ninety day resets then as 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 CEO, CEOs is to confirm the critical issues you're going to work on, the critical opportunities you're going after, the key things that are important to achieve in the next ninety days, and the number one thing you're going to get done, and then hold that and hold that group accountable to getting the work done. Yeah, absolutely. So, what do you think then? Uh, does did that have any impact, or, or is it related to the biggest evolution in business that you've experienced for yourself? Yeah. Look, uh, uh, you know, I guess the space I play in, Dave, is this uh, multi-site with with leadership teams and teams out there running community-facing and uh, um, clinics and and uh, businesses uh, supported by a corporate back end. And, and so, I've always been a strong fan of uh, empowering your team, allowing them to get on with it, and as a corporate support team, providing the back end services, providing the biz coaches to help them help those small teams out there in our communities and our suburbs achieve, you know, and become better than, than before we, we got involved with each other. Yeah, very cool. So it's having that, building that back end support, everything like that, that was one of the biggest shifts or evolutions in the business was providing that to them. Exactly, because you know, the old style of business is command and control and corporate headquarters and, you know, 
And what's happened through COVID-19 is suddenly everyone has to work from home. You know, you go when, when the big accounting firms and the big banks are, are all having team members work from home. You know, we've been doing that. Okay, our team members weren't working from home, they're working in multi-site. So yeah. there's deep trust, deep empowerment, deep way of supporting our team, just get on with doing the business they were supposed to do and doing the things. So it's coming up with, with I guess, a new model of workplaces. And that's what I love about COVID-19. It's, it's sped up, uh, you know, it's a revolution. Uh, it's sped up how we work and mm. uh, having the right KPIs, the right interactions, the right time to focus on the, the work that's got to get done, the project work, the right time and the, and the right nuances around how we collaborate, you know, you, using these sort of platforms of, of uh, digital, um, yep. you know, it's, it's changed. And, and yep. I guess to some degree, our model of, of multi-site um, cl clinics all over Australia, we sort of were doing a model anyway. And it's strong about empowerment. It's making sure the key performance indicators that you monitor are then coached and, and uh, developed and making sure those KPIs are the right one to get the right performance. Um, it's giving our teams the tools, the education, the skills development, uh, the IT platforms, the, the, the HR platforms, the coaching, all those things. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's great. It's a great time to be in business that we are in a revolution. The global pandemic is not going to lay fast. So, so we need to adapt and work out how we trust our employees to deliver their best um, under the framework and, and, and give them the right targets, the right KPIs, and I, I guess the right, the right way we interact to get, to get the performance. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And we'll talk about the future in just a moment, but I want to just touch on, you use the words coach a lot, which is really powerful. And I think there's been uh, new organizational models. Um, I've got up on my wall here in front of me uh, two years ago, I think we were preparing for another keynote around the same time as the one that we did over in Queensland. And it was about the future of leadership and the future of work and everything. And I did all this research and uh, it's got leadership in the new world of work. What does that look like? And it's quite funny now because as I read through all that stuff I wrote up there, it's everything that's happening right now in terms of, you know, we, we need a new organizational model. We want to have um, a network of teams that are interdependent but interlinked, which is what you have set up in terms of your clinics. That people want coaches, not bosses anymore. Um, you know, and they want people who are going to empower them and build them up, not tear them down. Uh, you know, we, we've got to create a better employee experience for people. You know, and another thing is that we need to embrace new technology, like we've been forced to embrace it a lot of people when they should have been embracing it anyway. Um, but a way to embrace technology to bring people together, not apart. I think it's funny thing that we all got sent to our rooms only to find out how much connection we, we craved. And we probably learned more about each other being sent to our rooms yeah. uh, than we did when we were working together in, in close proximity. It's quite fascinating. It is, and, and, and look, you know, I guess the analogy is, is uh, that, that willingness to collaboration, being able to talk and, and bringing stuff out of the, the front part of your brain and, and, and having those conversations. You can think about it or you can talk about it and having tools to be able to talk through through isolation, but that, that is one key part that you still have to uh, make room to be able to, to have those conversations, be it via Zoom, be it in subrooms, or still future of work is bringing us together but yep. still having uh, home offices or home workspaces, yet collaboration time that comes together to get the best out of our, our team. But I keep coming back to the to comments I say to even in, in uh, healthier and people infrastructure today and in Green Cross. And the only time I ever lost my cool in Green Cross, and I had my all my middle managers, my area managers around me, or my area coaches. And one of my area coaches said, "Look." You don't know how hard it is. I have to keep going into each clinic and make sure they're doing their thing. I'm going, mate, and I lost it. I said, you got the model wrong. If we have to keep going back into each clinic and micromanaging each of our practice managers and senior clinicians, we got it wrong. We've blown it up. Mm. So forget it. We have to go in and find out what best practice is in across our networks and coach best practice. We have to bring them together in each region and share ideas. And then we've got to put the cape the eyes in place to monitor that those best ideas are implemented. But if you have to go back in each week and micromanage each clinic, we have got the wrong model. And it's the same. If we've got to monitor our and manage our people so closely that they feel stifled, they're not going to give you their best efforts. They're not right. going to be empowered. They're not going to give you their best thinking. And you've got the model wrong. So it's, yeah. 
There's, it's in the recruitment that you're looking for people that like autonomy, that like to be challenged, like to contribute, and then you've got to put the frameworks and the KPIs and the coaching programs in place to get the best out of them, not the management structures that are going to stifle their, their creativity. And that's, that's something I've always fought hard in, in any organisation I've been involved with, that we have these, these command and control leaders that, that think that, uh, you know, or, or there's a power play going on. Forget power play. It is very much around trying to get the best out of our people and let them get on with it. And if they make mistakes, it's a great learning experience. You've heard everyone talk. Let them, yeah. let them fail a little bit, not catastrophically, but a little bit, because they learn from that. Yeah. And my own CEO, COO, Terry, in the early days of Green Cross, said to me, you know, Glenn, I need a hand on this problem I'm having. And I've given him the answer straight away. I said, Terry, that's what I would do if I was you. This was what I would do. And uh, he's walked out and said, thanks, Glenn. He came back five minutes later and said, Glenn, you know, I wasn't coming into your office to get the answer. I was coming into your office to be asked the questions that would help my thinking. I went, hey, thanks, mate. You, you, I, I need you to hold that mirror up every now and again. Yeah, and that's great because it's what I talk about coaching the gap. It's, um, you know, you didn't get to be who you are today without making the mistakes that you made. Oh, lots of mistakes. Lots of mistakes. Um, to become what you need to become uh, going forward in the future, how do you expect to do that without making more mistakes? You know, and it's like even as a parent, we, we, we don't want, I don't want my kids to make the exact same mistakes. I mean, I, I expect they're going to make mistakes. I just hope they don't make the same ones I made so they can learn from my mistakes and make their own mistakes. But they're going to have to make mistakes. And our employees, and it's our job to coach the gap between whatever thinking they have and the thinking that we, would, we need to be um, to make sure that we help them every time. And it's all about shifting the thinking, not trying to change the behavior straight away. Which is why I'm keen on mentors and peer mentors. Peer, peer mentor are those friends or those business colleagues that you catch up with for a coffee, you know, weekly or monthly, and just shoot the breeze. The mentors, it's more, it's more formal. Um, but you know, the reality is, they are people that have probably had made mistakes or they've got experience in area. And you can't just have one mentor because there's so many different things coming at us in business that we need people who have a better understanding of marketing, perhaps better understanding of IT platforms better understanding of, of uh, autonomous business machines or, yeah. or uh, robotics or whatever you're going, but you, you reach out and it might be a, only a few short sessions in being mentored around that space, but business community is so giving, willing to, you know, can I, can I shout you a cup of coffee and can you tell me around what sort of software platforms I should be putting in my business and you sit there and have a chat yeah. and then they'll ask you some hard questions about it. So, you know, mentoring and peer mentoring is vital and, and you're interacting with people that are like us, probably made some serious mistakes in the past and we're willing to share our learnings. And that, that business community is very, very giving on that front. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, we've got a couple of questions coming up which I want to ask you, the, the, the audience there, and I appreciate we're running low, low on time. So the last thing um, before we get into a bunch of questions is, what, what do you see, Glenn? What, what do you see, you know, if you think about the future work, future leadership, we started talking a little bit about this already. If you were to, you know, give anyone advice to be prepared for, you know, one or two things that you think that, you know, that you're seeing that you'd like to share with everybody. Look, it's probably the same argument I had about six, seven years ago in Green Cross. It's the omni view of the world. You know, people are now thinking we've got good digital platforms and they're evolving to be better. We've got good digital tools that help us collaborate uh, in far flung places in Australia or around the world. Um, it's coming up with, with, I guess, the way that we can interact and get the best model. Um, you know, any company I invest in now, it's got to think globally how it can operate. Um, mm. But I know when it operates, it'll have people working from home. It'll have people coming into central locations to have more face time. Um, it'll have uh, better connectivity. Uh, it'll have better uh, collaboration tools. But a key part to all this is is that that group accountability, group trust, group collective wisdom, and absolutely key performance indicators that let us know as leaders that our team is effective and achieving the right, uh, I, I guess, right position in the marketplace with our customers. At the end of the day, we have to know that our customers are happy and our customers are already thinking on me, you know, I want to shop online, I want to shop in store, I want to click and collect, um, I want, uh, quite happy to, to have a digital chat with, with, a, with, a, with a bot, um, but at some point I want to be able to pick up the phone and talk to a real person with a real voice uh, and understand my problems. 
Um, you know, so it's omni. We, we are evolving so fast and we're allowing it to happen. Um, and I guess the, the future of workplaces is, is going to be deeply collaborative, but it's going to be collaborative anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah. And a lot of some of the, the software platforms I'm seeing come through now is, is the way we assist that collaboration. Yeah. Uh, but I still argue that FaceTime, real interactions, you know, if you and I could meet, we're probably going to pick up some more communication. We're oh. going to ask some harder questions of each, of each other because we're faced together. Yeah. Um, and so we still got to have those FaceTime, those real people-to-people um, -people interactions to get the best out of our work teams, um, to have the best feedback from our customers. That's still going to take place. Yeah, no, I agree fully with you that. And I, and I think it's going to be a nice blender, uh, recompose, redefine, what do you distribute the way of working, but also distribute the way like it. So I think it's an omni way of working as well as an omni way of you know, receiving goods and services. So I, I agree with you fully. All right, so we got some questions coming in from a bunch of people which I'd like to ask because we've got four minutes left. But before we do that, I told you there'll be one random question. So I have 31 questions written down here. You get to pick from number from one to 31. You can't see what the questions are. The, uh, Pick a number, but the only thing is you must answer the question. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether your thinking was getting more radical and random as you got to 31, or whether your best thinking was early. So I'm going to go with number three, my favourite number. Okay. Oh, that's going to be quite easy. And actually, I started with more random questions at the beginning than I did at the end. Um, so question number three is, what is your go-to meal and or restaurant? Like what you would order. Bring every, you know, do you have a go-to meal and what is it? And if you want to name, name the place where you get it, then that's fine. Or if it's something you know. but Actually, I've got to give this two-part two, two answer. Go-to meal is if we're home. Yeah. Uh, standing rib roast is, is our favourite. Uh, oh. if, if it's home cooking. If it's to go out, we love, we love right. Asian, Asian fusion. Uh, and being up on the Sunshine Coast, I'll give a plug for some young guys. Uh, yeah. uh, they're pretty famous, having come off one of those little, uh, or one of those large... Uh, uh, programs that highlight chefs on TV. I think it was Master Chef they were on. Uh, but some young guys is a beautiful Asian fusion meals. Uh, love it. Um, so if we're going out, Asian fusion. If we're home, standing rib roast. Okay, beautiful. Now, a quick question uh, from the audience came through is, you've talked about the power of questioning, we'll both have, uh, and having a coach along the journey. Do you still have a coach? Probably more peer mentors these days, people that, that I interact with quite regularly. Um, and I've probably got a circle of about 10 people that I regularly uh, have coffee with, phone in with, uh, Zoom call with um, on different areas and different subjects. So in terms of, and I guess because I'm an investor uh, and mentor and advisor and board role sort of person now, um, yeah. I probably should have a mentor, but I, I, I argue that I have this network of peer mentors that we have seriously robust conversations. Um, if I'm going to invest, I've got my analyst who will give me feedback. I've got some fellow investors now that we bounce off each other. Um, I've got um, old friends and old former CEOs that, that we still interact. So I, I see my network now as peer mentors and people that are willing um, and not afraid to, to, to throw stuff back in my face and challenge my thinking. Yeah, great. Uh, and, and that's, that's the, and I have the same thing. I have, I have coaches in like from PTs and uh, marketing and a few things like that, but I have uh, three core mentors that I can call on any time about major life or business things, so which would be powerful to have. And I always say, like, if you're ever going to hire a coach, first question you should ask them is, do they have a coach? Yeah, I agree. Whether they believe in the value of coaching or not. Um, another question that came in uh, was, uh, what is uh, what is a key components must be in a business plan to make it effective? Is there some just a couple of key components? Um, look, the, the financial roadmap, absolutely, and yep. then an operational roadmap that goes alongside those things. Um, who's doing what, when? Um, so you do have to break it right down from strategic activity and then the tactics that you're going to achieve in the next. One week, next ninety days. Who's doing what when? Um, you know, otherwise it, it becomes too esoteric. It's still, you know, I'll get it done sometime. You've got to get down to what am I working on today? So I still do the list every single week, if not every single day. I still check my list, add stuff to it, and stuff I'm going to get done to make sure I'm achieving stuff. Um, and and quite simply, I think the same in a business plan that that you big hairy audacious goal. That's a vision, three year financial targets, so you develop financial targets for the next 90 days, the next six months, the next 12 months, the next three years. 
and then you coincide that with with uh, or synchronize an operational plan on what am I working on today, tomorrow, this week, and this month to to get us to where we're going to get to. Yeah, and I mean, if I'm, uh, I worked on four frameworks, and so you have to have a cultural framework, which is all the purpose, values, vision of the organization, then your strategic yep. framework, which is the mission three and twelve month objectives, then a tactical framework, which is the next ninety day objectives and the plan to do that. And then the last piece is obviously the performance framework, which is the, the KPIs, how you can measure it and you know, all the metrics. Love, love, love it. I love, I love that because it then, then puts some rigor and discipline in the way you're approaching the execution phase. And, you know, business plan's beautiful, but it gathers dust unless you're going to execute. And, let, and the other part to that is pulling it off the, the shelf and reviewing the plan every 90 days. Or if you're in a fast-paced changing industry like say IT or software development, you probably should be doing strategic resets every 30 days. Yeah, and, you know, if you're not doing strategic resets every 90 days, you're crazy in this world. Um, yeah. Should be, and I agree with you. Another question that quickly came up was about KPIs, just what are those it's called key performance indicators. To me, they're the things that indicate that we're on track for our key results. So what are the things that we would measure to show that if these, because there's lead and lag indicators, so there's sometimes the lag indicators, we, we we can't see, but the key performance indicators tell us, well, if we're doing these things fairly well, it should indicate that we will achieve this performance or this result. So, yeah, uh, and, I, and I, I'm a big fan of uh, the balance scorecard with Kaplan and Norton work from, what is it, 20 years ago, but yeah. spot on having those lead indicators that give you hopefully some view on where you're going and the lag indicators tell you where you came from. Yeah, yeah, all right. Mate, um, we're at uh, 11.02, and uh, I really appreciate and value your time today, Dr. Glenn. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time away from your family while you're up on the sunny coast there to share uh, your wisdom with us. Uh, if people want to connect or follow or find out some of the stuff that you're working on, is there anywhere that they can go? To... Um, I'm hopeless on social media, but I do check my LinkedIn account every few days, so that's probably the best place to track me down. Yeah, so uh, what you're saying is you're social mediocre. The, uh, Social mediocre, at big time. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, again, really appreciate your time. Everybody who tuned in on the live, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, if there's some more questions, I'll make sure I get the answers in there and we'll post those up uh, for the other questions that come through. Um, I did have one other question for my buddy Jim, who wanted to know how the hell you maintain your passion for so long. But um, I think uh, that came through pretty prevalent in all your uh, conversations there. You just got to love what you're doing. Absolutely. Love, love, love business, but you also got to keep your health up too. I'm a big fan of, of uh, making sure you're growing uh, and looking after your physical health as well as your, uh, your mental health. And, uh, uh, and then you can bring, it, bring your A game whenever you go onto the business uh, field. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've sort of learned that as a, as a man uh, over 15 LB. Uh, I've learned the, uh, the, the sheer importance, and I wish I'd actually invested a lot more time when I was younger, but I'm so glad I'm investing it now. Spot on. Yeah. All right, mate. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, that was the Evolution of Business podcast kickoff with Dr. Glenn Richards. Thank you, Dave. Really enjoyed the, the chat. Thanks.